Howdy. My name is Nonet, and before we jump into today's video, I have been asked by our generous sponsor, Loremaster.io, to show off some of the cool features you can use right now in their program. And rather than give you some boring scripted spiel, I'm just going to do it live for you right here. I have my personal campaign playing through a very heavily modified Extinction Curse open in Loremaster.io. You can see right here, I have a very, very simplistic flowchart of Erinport as well as the people inside of it. I can click on Helga, I can go right to her Emporium and learn things about her, and then I can go right back to my canvas for Erinport. I don't have a lot of different pages, but this is really helpful for me. But that's not what I'm here to show off here today. I'm here to show off the excellent intuitive theme customization you can add to make Loremaster look exactly how you need it to be, starting with your canvases. If you want to, you can go right up here to the Change Canvas Background, upload any file you want to, just click Add to Library, and since Erinport is a pirate town, I want a piratey looking picture. I click on it and I insert file, and boom, right on the background I have all of these which I can already reorganize, and boom, I have a big piratey looking picture for Erinport once I reorganize everything, putting it right back where it belongs. It is now way nicer to look at. You can also change the background image of your entire campaign. And like I said, I'm doing a modified uh, extinction curse, so I can add that to library, click that, boom, that's going to be the picture for my campaign. The final big thing, and this is gonna make a ton of people happy, if you click this little gear in the corner for world settings, you can change the theme. If I wanna match the blue and yellowish gold theme that Extinction Curse has got going on, I could choose the navy option, save the changes. You can see all the buttons have updated to blue, everything has a nice cool color to it, or maybe if I wanna go a little more extreme, I could even pick something like royal. Now we've got the nice purple over here with the nice yellow background instead of the black. There are tons of themes to choose from. Pardon my dog scratching in the background. She's in the bedroom and she wishes she was here recording with me. You can pick from all of these different themes and they're going to be adding more in time. It is a fantastic option just to customize the look of the UI. This has nothing to do with how efficient or great everything already works. But honestly, I think it's a great feature to have, how easy it is. I really like this. So if you want this kind of customization in your campaign organizer, check out loremaster.io using the link in the description. Thank you so much to Loremaster for sponsoring this video. Now let's get on with it. I have done a grave disservice. When I made my brand new ranged weapons video back when Guns and Gears was new and fresh, I didn't include a specific type of weapon and y'all made sure I heard it. And believe me, I heard it. I heard it so much that I have very crippling back pain, so I had to go to the chiropractor, and now I'm feeling tired and in pain, so we're gonna record this video in bed with my dog. Say hi, Ka. But I am here to talk to you about beast guns. Now, I won't be going over the beast gunner archetype, that'll be for a future video, but what is a beast gun? A beast gun is effectively a unique firearm that fires a unique ammunition, but they are very special. They're far more than just a flaming arquebus. They are an entirely new weapon of their own with very special uses and abilities, and we're going to go over all of them right now. But first, I would like to ask you to click the link in the description to check out the Backer Kit landing page for Sinclair's Library, which if you're not aware, is a Kickstarter coming in March that'll include two brand new supplements for your Pathfinder 2 e-experience, Sinclair's Almanac and Sinclair's Codex. The Codex is going to have over 150 unique NPCs for game masters to put into their campaigns at a moment's notice. And these aren't just stat blocks. These have names, they have backstories, they do have stat blocks, and they have lists optional plot hooks for ways to give them side quests and integrate them into your world. It's effectively a massive toy box for GMs to plug and play right into your campaign. And players, we've got you covered too with the Almanac with over 120 brand new player options, including the very, very hyped Cursed Archetype system. Look at the art. These are going to be archetypes that are not necessarily just a beneficial effect. If you are bitten by a werewolf, you may gain the Lycanthropy Archetype. Starting with the dedication, you might gain an enhanced sense of smell at the cost of becoming slightly off-putting to those around you, and more. Will you choose to embrace the curse, gain all of its benefits and drawbacks, or will you find a healer to cleanse you of this malady? The choice is yours. 
Sinclair's library is coming to Kickstarter in March, so please click the link in the description and sign up for our email mailing list so you know exactly when it goes live. And by the way, between you, me, and the other couple thousand people watching this video, if you pledge early and you are on the mailing list, you get a free set of dice. Yes, anybody who joins the mailing list and pledges to Sinclair's library within the first 48 hours of the Kickstarter going live will receive a bandit dice set based on one of our big bad villains, Liliana. So click the link in the description to sign up for Sinclair's library. I promise you will not be disappointed. Now for beast guns. Starting off, the lowest level beast gun is level four with the Drake rifle. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It is a plus one rifle made out of a dragon, and the dragon it's made from determines the damage. It always deals 1d10 electric, fire, acid, cold, or what? Poison damage, depending on which type of dragon was killed and crafted into this rifle. Additionally, if you get a critical strike with the Drake rifle, the projectile actually leaves spittle on the target, dealing 1d4 persistent damage of the same type, which is amazing. However, this does replace the usual firearm crit specialization effect. On top of its normal ability to shoot things, it has a three action activity that allows you to load a special high pressure ammunition, which does a bunch of splash damage and additional effects depending on the type of dragon it was made from. When you use this activity, even on a normal failure, the target and all creatures within five feet of the target take one splash damage of the same element as the weapon per weapon damage die and deals an additional effect depending on the type of dragon it was made from. If the Drake Rifle deals acid damage, the target becomes sickened one. If the Drake Rifle deals cold damage, the target takes a minus 10 foot speed penalty for one minute. And if it deals electricity damage, they become dazzled and flat footed for 1d4 rounds. Fire damage causes a massive explosion, pushing the target 10 feet back. And if they were on the ground, they are knocked prone, and if it deals poison damage, they become enfeebled and clumsy for one full minute. All of these effects with no saving throw. Can we talk about that? Now this is only once per day and only on the main target, not everyone in the splash, but that's all insane. A guaranteed knock prone, a guaranteed, well I guess not guaranteed, it doesn't work on a normal failure, it does have to be a normal hit, but it's still amazing effects. The Drake Rifle is honestly spectacular, and for a level 4 weapon, kind of insane. The level 6 Spider Gun's base ability is very similar to the Drake Rifle. It is a plus 1 striking weapon, whereas the Drake Rifle was only plus 1, no striking. This also deals 1d10 poison damage, and on a critical hit leaves 1d4 persistent poison damage. It actually deals 1d4 plus the number of damage die persistent poison damage, which is amazing. The Drake Rifle was actually the same way, so since this is striking, that is 1d4 plus 2 persistent poison damage, which is a minimum of 3 per round. Sure, you're level 6, but that ain't nothing. Now what's fun is once per round for one action, you can fire a glob of spider web to fill a single square on the battle grid. Has anyone ever called it a battle grid before? I don't think so. If a creature ever starts their turn in that square, they must make a basic reflex save or athletics check before taking a movement action. If they fail, it becomes difficult terrain, and if they crit fail, they're actually immobilized. The only downside is that the webbing is very easy to break. One point of fire damage, five points of slashing damage, or just rolling a successful check to move through it all destroys it, but hey, if you attack, reload, and shoot a glob of webbing, that's a pretty good turn, because the glob of webbing does not have the attack trait. There are also greater and major spider guns, but those just increase the DC of the check slash saving throw, and make the webbing a little more durable. Overall, eh, I think the Drake Rifle's a little bit better. Weird that this is a level 6 item, honestly. The Spike Launcher is basically a really cool sniper. With a 120 foot range increment, the Backstabber trait, the Kickback trait, Reload 2, and the Fatal Aim D12 trait, this thing is made to set up, take aim, and make one shot that counts. Keep in mind that Fatal Aim means you can use the weapon in one hand, but you don't get the Fatal trait on crits, so you really want to make sure you're focusing when using the Spike Launcher. 
Now where the spike launcher is absolutely broken for a level 6 weapon is its activation ability. For 3 actions, you can fire a volley of spikes in a 10 foot burst anywhere within its range, which I still need clarification here if range is like the range increment or range is up to the 6th range increment. Either way, you make an attack against every creature in the burst. If you succeed, they take a 5 foot speed penalty. If you critically succeed, the creature is immobilized. Now what I don't know for certain is does this do damage too? It's only once per day, so I assume you are shooting a 10 foot burst that can let you make like 5 attacks if you can land it on that many enemies? And it doesn't say anything about multiple attack penalty progressing, so I'm guessing they're all at the same bonus. Is that how this works? Is this a three action attack at level six that can let you attack five, six, even more creatures if they're lined up correctly at no penalty and immobilize them on a crit? Someone correct me and tell me this is wrong. The tentacle cannon is pretty good. It's a plus one striking 1d8 piercing weapon with a 30 foot range increment. It's got capacity five, so you can shoot it five times before having to reload, but it is reload two, meaning if you want to reload, all five tentacle capacity, it's going to take you 10 actions. Now, luckily, you can reload them one at a time if you want. Every turn can be reload two, shoot, reload two, shoot, if you need it to be. It's also got fatal d12, because firearm, and it's got concussive, which is always really good to have. This deals piercing or bludgeoning damage, depending on which one would result in the higher total damage against a creature. Not bad. Now, what's crazy is this thing has three different activatable functions. First off, you can command one of the tentacles to extend out of the barrel and make a plus 13 grapple check against any creature within 15 feet, which is so cool. There's also no size restriction on this, so this thing can grapple a gargantuan creature at no penalty. And if you succeed, it also pulls the creature 10 feet toward you. I don't know why you'd want to pull them toward you as you're a gunslinger, but maybe if you're a vanguard? Now where this thing is really interesting is in its second function. If you currently have something grappled, for another action, you can shoot out a different tentacle to grab a different creature. It's still at plus 13, I honestly don't know why this is a separate action, but oh, because it's only one action. If you have something grabbed with the initial activation, which is two actions, you can grab something else for one action. And this doesn't have the attack trait. It just says with a plus 13 bonus. That's amazing. This says nothing about the attack trait. This says nothing about a multiple attack penalty. And you are not using your athletics bonus. This is basically three actions to grapple two creatures, both at plus 13. Is that a lot at level seven? Not really, that's like being trained in athletics, but that's good economy. Finally, once per hour, you can spray a 15 foot cone of ink that if they fail the DC 23 reflex save, they are blinded for one round and dazzled for a minute because it's really hard to get ink out of your eye. You ever spill ink on your skin? That ain't going anywhere. Now this would be great, especially because on a crit failure, they're blinded and dazzled for a full minute. That sounds incredible until you read the next line that the creature or an adjacent creature can spend one action to remove the ink. One action, that's fine. They manage to crit fail their reflex save, they're blind, I'm good. Do you know how hard it would be to get ink out of your eyes? One action is two seconds. That's literally, ah, uh, I'm fine. Come on, at least let them remain dazzled. Let them remove the blinded, but keep the dazzled. That makes it so weak. And if you want to use the tentacle cannon all the way through to level 20, there are greater and major versions which increase the DC of the ink saving throw and increase the bonus to grapple. Very fun. The level 8 Breath Blaster is a blunderbuss that is, and I quote, commonly crafted from the trachea of a dragon. This is very similar to the Drake Rifle, but a blunderbuss. It deals the same type of damage as the type of dragon it was created from. Interestingly, this is one of the simplest beast guns. This is just a normal blunderbuss that can be activated as a breath weapon of a dragon. For two actions, 
once per minute, you can shoot out a 4d6 damage breath weapon of, depending on the dragon, either a 15-foot cone or a 30-foot line of the appropriate damage type. Otherwise, it's just a blunderbuss. It's cool, don't get me wrong, it's great. Now, the DC is going to be set at DC 24 reflex save, and that's not going to go up, but if you do want to increase both the damage and the saving throw, there are greater and major versions. Additionally, at level 18, with the major version, the distance of the cone or line breath weapon is doubled. The growth gun is disgusting. I love it. The growth gun is a level 9, only plus 1 striking hand cannon. I don't know why it's not plus 2, but... Check this, it's created from the regenerative mass of Hydras and Trolls. So, the ammunition in the gun grows back every round. You do not need to reload the growth gun. Once per round, a glob of ammunition regrows inside of it. It's also modular, and when you choose bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing, it grows flesh, bone, or teeth for each damage type. So depending on which damage type you've selected, it grows a different type of ammunition to deal that damage. That is disgusting, and I love it. Additionally, for two actions, you can launch a glob of growing flesh that will stick to your target if you successfully hit them with the strike and make them slowed one for one round. This is so cool, this is so gross, but it's amazing for a pistolero. This is a gun that you don't need to reload. If you're holding two of these, bam, bam, do something with your third action. Next round, they're already both reloaded. That's incredible. Also at level 9, we have the Screech Shooter, which is a Harmona gun that deals sonic damage instead of physical damage. Additionally, for two actions, you can activate the Screech Shooter to let out a massive, high-pitched, horrifying shriek that makes every creature all creatures in a 30-foot emanation make a DC 25 will save. That does not say enemies, that says creatures, so your allies are making the save too. On a normal success, you're frightened 1, fail is frightened 2, and a crit fail is frightened 3 and fleeing for one round. There are, of course, greater and major screech shooters, which increase the DC of the saving throw and the size of the emanation, capping out at a 50-foot emanation to make everybody terrified. I like this a lot. It's kind of weird that it affects your allies because they could see it coming. As a GM, I might have it affect them the first two or three times, but after the character used the Screech Shooter multiple times, I'd probably have the party get used to it. Otherwise, really, really neat, unique weapon. And our final beast gun found all the way at level 15 is the Petrification cannon, which is a double-barreled musket. It is also, and I quote, built from the taxidermic body of a basilisk. <coughs> so this is just a handheld basilisk with a trigger. As far as normal attacks go, it's just a plus two greater striking two-barreled musket. It does not change the damage type, the damage amount, or any of the traits. It can, however, once per hour for two actions be activated to effectively cast Flesh to Stone with a 60-foot range and a DC of 34. If you're unaware, Flesh to Stone, if you fail, makes you slowed one and requires you to make successful saving throws, which if you keep failing, will eventually lead to full petrification. And those are all the beast guns. I am going to continue to lie down, Tomorrow's Nonat will get to edit this video because I'm not doing it tonight because I'm tired and in pain. But hopefully you guys don't mind me being a little bit lazy and recording from my bed. I just want to make sure I get you guys the content you deserve. Another huge shout out to loremaster.io for sponsoring the channel this month. They've been wonderful to have. Definitely click the link in the description and pledge to their Patreon to gain access to Loremaster in their early alpha, beta, whichever it is and get using that program. It's so nice, guys. Like, not even sponsored segment. I've been using it for all of my campaigns, and it's so easy to organize. Also, don't forget to check out Sinclair's library's landing page. Sign up for the mailing list in the description so you will know exactly when it goes live. Thank you to my patrons and all of my new patrons who have joined. If you are unaware, we are releasing playtest material for Sinclair's library on the Patreon. 
if you want to get access to things like some early cursed archetypes like lycanthropy and corruption. Join the Patreon for $10 or more, depending on your pledge, you get access to the playtest material right now. So if you click that link, pledge to the No Not Once Patreon for $10, you'll get access to it immediately, and there's more playtest stuff coming up, all leading up to our big launch in March. Oh my god, I'm so tired. I'm gonna go take a nap and eat some dinner. You guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and until next time, No Not Once.